Good morning, welcome to Office Hours. If you're new here and want to learn more about what we do as you're joining us from YouTube, go to officehours.global. First hour is always general questions. The second hour, Albert, we're gonna talk about neurodiversity and Albert Kim is our um, special guest who's also here for the first hour. Um, Mitchell, what do we have for questions? Yeah, that is the question. The first one I'm reluctant to read, but I will, just because it's from Chad Lafarge in Columbia, Missouri. It says, Mitchell, what's the best mic to use when singing happy birthday? He's asking for some friends. Mitchell, whose birthday might it be today? Well, I'm sure there are a lot of people. I think um, Guy uh, Sky, Sky's Guy. birthday is today. Thank you, John. Um, and uh, this guy's birthday, too, today. And to answer the question, I would use a Mr. Microphone, and I don't know if uh, John can uh, dash over and get it. No, it's not quite there, but uh, Mr. Microphone for singing happy birthday, particularly to people you know. So, Well, I suppose that. that means that we need to, um, I was not prepared to do this this morning, but it's Saturday. Um, shall we just all sing? John Preto, would you be able to lead us? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's try this. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to, to you. you. Me. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy, Happy birthday, dear Mitchell and Joe. dog. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to, to you. you. That's uh, so wonderful, and it makes it so perfect when uh, we try to uh, sync that up and uh, and sing. Thank you very much. Happy birthday, Mitchell. Next question. From Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. Chris asks, AIDA Imaging PTZ NDI X81B Broadcast NDI HX FHD NDI IP HDMI 18X Zoom PTZ Camera Black for sub 800 seems pretty good for a portable kit for run and gun meetings. Thoughts? Any other NDI suggestions in the same price point? John Preto. I, I'm not a fan of these low end PTZ cameras, even the low end PTZ optics cameras, which I have the generation one, the optics on PT optics camera, the colors aren't that great on those low end PTZ cameras. I would look, elsewhere i would look at the used market to chris that's what i would suggest yeah and definitely look at the used market and also make sure that you know as john pointed out what what you're getting for the price i mean the price is great but if you're not getting what's going to be usable we we here at office hours run on a buy once, cry once philosophy. So um, make sure you're getting what you know will work for what you're going to do. With that being said, next question. Thank you. Next one in from Jack Rupel in Breckenridge, Colorado. Jack asked, what time code app do you use on your iPad or iPhone? Anyone attach these devices to a clapper? Yeah. Um, I'm not, I don't actually use time code. Um, so this might be one that um, reach into off, after hours or into the office hours discord and ask um, currently or bring it back on another day when some of our um, people are here. Mitchell, you had some thoughts? Um, I just happen to know that uh, you can get a great app for your sound devices. It's called Wingman and allows you to remote control your uh, your system and I, there are a number of different apps out there that allow you to uh, do synchronization setting time code across various devices uh, via Bluetooth but I I'm sorry I'm not the expert on it and as you said Wednesday is a good day to ask that question exactly um next question from Chris Widener in Lafayette Indiana there's a link there that starts it out for a small meeting space for a nonprofit three camera plus slide deck laptop what do we think? Add a, p a power over internet uh, switch, maybe a wireless mic set, and GTG. 
John Edelson. Hi, Chris. Yes, I looked at this. It's a very interesting setup. Uh, we tested the previous version of that switcher, the L2 or the L1. This is the L2 Plus. And the real advantage of this over the ATEM that we were using with our parks project is that it has a little screen on it. So you did not have to have a second monitor. And when we're out in the field, having less pieces of gear made a difference. It did not work perfectly for us because the screen wasn't really quite bright enough for when we were out in the sun. But uh, it sounds like in a small room, that won't be an issue. Um, I'm not sure the advantage of getting something like this where you have everything from one vendor. Where we've had success was using a software switcher. It's the Cinemaker. And we use iPhones as cameras. So for about the same price, you could get a, a uh, book, uh, a, you know, a laptop, a uh, computer, three iPhones, and then do the switching through the software. And that's what we've used because then we could pull things together and have more replacement parts if something happens. Thank you. Um, yeah, and uh, John, I just want to say it's nice to have you back. It's been a long time since you've been with us on a Saturday, and I see Aaron's here as well. And what do we, Mitchell? What do we have for our next question? Next one in is from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. Paul asks, "What is the best wired and wireless headset with a mic for a newer iPad with USB C and the best low priced?" I know Alex likes both the Countryman and the DPA, and the the only thing would be would be actually going to Amazon and probably finding a little converter that goes XLR or USB to USB C. In this day and age, it's not as much about what it's built for as necessarily what you can um, convert it to. Next question. From Brendan Gilbert in Fort Worth, Texas, Brendan asks, what wireless portable high gain mic can you recommend for phones so deaf people like us can have better results with auto translation? For example, Google Transcribe or Apple Google Live Caption. Brendan, you wanted to speak on this? Yeah, this is Brendan here. So typically phones are great uh, for picking up sound and you kind of put it into someone's face and it can be really clear, but sometimes there is problems. If, if you're at the dinner table with my family, for instance, and I, I don't want to put it in front of everyone's face, it's too much to do that. So I'm trying to find if there's something small, I have an old version that I don't really want to use with a USB. It doesn't really work with the iPhone. And it looks like this. So this is what I have right now, this generic mic and I hate it. It's 360, but I'm wondering if there's something, does anyone know if there's anything else new out there? I actually don't. That's a really good question. Um, is, does any of the panel, have anybody heard anything? Um, it would be something, Mitchell? Yeah, I was just going to jump in and say that's a Wednesday question for us, Brendan. Generally, our audio experts are here. And uh, just in case, I'm going to check over to uh, the event chat to see if anybody's commenting. Nope, no, nothing over there just yet. So I would uh, re-enter that question for Wednesday's group. Well, I'm going to drop in here. He was asking for a specific uh, hardware. Go ahead, John. But the, uh, there's an app called Hear That. And it's a pretty interesting app. It was designed by the same person who created a, a program called Levelizers that balanced audio levels in podcasts and was also used for an app where you could sync uh, video editing by just having a soundtrack. You didn't need the time code. And what um, this app does is sort of gets a mask of what the general room noise is and then uses the um, AI basically to bring the speech out. So the hear that has worked very well for uh, for me when I've had it and for a friend of mine who also uh, needs to really get some amplification, particularly in a noisy restaurant. That's that that that's that's great. Um John, do you have a link you could drop into the chat 
at, at some point. I will make sure I get it into Discord. Thank you. And next question. From Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas, PI.AI is very conversational. Have you had a talk with it? Brendan? Yeah, just a little short here. So the first time that I looked at it, I was just kind of playing around with it. It's almost like, it's like your personal friend. You can have a nice little conversation with it. It's cool to use. I think it's it's better than the standard answers um, from like chat GPT. This is more like, hey, how are you doing today? Oh, that's cool. There's a lot of conversational uh, influences in it. John Edelson? Yes, I've, I've had some conversations with it, but more for me with my first conversation was uh, deja vu all over again. Back in, I think it was either 64 or 65, there's a program called ELIZA. And this was a text chat. Uh, John, you're shaking your head, so you're dating your, your age. That program was actually a parody because it was using... Um, you know, a, a technique that was used by some psychologists where you would say, how do you feel today? And say, I feel sad. And then I would say, well, why do you feel sad? Uh, it really had, it had um, recognition of words and it used the words that you did to repeat them back to you. And it was sort of a fun party game and a good parody. So go back to 1964 and my 1964 mind, I, I came forward and my first playing with it was trying to do sort of that Eliza. I was I was pretty impressed with the uh, the pie. Um, what was interesting is although I've been playing with the AI uh, to create some lesson plans to help our park rangers you know change some of their electronic field trip copy, we sent the you know, we take the scripts that they've been working on and put it in into some of the AI programs and change uh, grade level words and such. But I have to admit, I, I started thinking this is just sort of like a parody of my old Eliza days. And it turned out to have a fairly interesting conversation. And the nice thing is that if I didn't agree with it, I could turn it off. Go ahead, John Prado. So, Paul, you weren't paying attention. Yes. So we talked about this earlier in the week. This is interesting. This this is the name of the company. Um is called inflection. These are guys that came from from Deep Mind, and this is uh, very well funded by Microsoft and Nvidia. Uh, they just raised one point three billion dollars for this application on a valuation of four billion dollars, and they're going to deploy twenty two hundred Nvidia H one hundred GPUs. Just that card itself is thirty thousand dollars. Multiply that by twenty two thousand gives you an idea of how much compute power you need in order to do this. And this is the best conversational AI that I've ever played with. If this thing doesn't pass the Turing test, then we've got a long way to go, but it's, it's really fun to play with. Absolutely. I appreciate that. Um, just a reminder that we have a great panel here today. Um, education experts, disability experts. So if there's a question that, you are thinking about and that you want to have answered, um, go to go into Mukana and become a producer by putting your questions in. Next question. Thank you, Laura. Jack Rupel from Breckenridge, Colorado asked, any experience with do why casual inference? I have not heard of this. I will have to go look it up after the show. Um, I don't know that anybody, you may have stumped, stumped us, Jack, but now that it's on our radar, I think we're all going to be looking it up. Next question. Chris Wider, Lafayette, Indiana. Anyone tried Vuzix Blade 2 smart glasses? What are your thoughts? Go ahead, Brendan. Uh, yeah, so I have seen it and I've seen how it works, but um, I'm more familiar with the neural ones. These.
This one, that one you're talking about is a little bit different. So it has more of a bigger frame. And I noticed that it's a small window for captions, I guess. I think if they wanted to use it for captions, that might be great. It's X, uh, Xander. If you look up that one, that might be a better idea. You could use that one to, because the captions are in a little box. Like this one is a little different. It has more of a computer screen. So it has a bigger frame and everything on it. But this one looks great, uh, the VU ZIX, but it's just not there yet, I don't think. I think to each his own, everyone has a different preference what they're looking for. Yes, I know in the um, realm of visual um, glasses and smart glasses, the eyesight was the original. And then there's been a couple others of them that have come up behind. I did a demo of the eyesight several years ago, but it was still at that time pretty cost prohibitive. Um, sure. That's... Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of these kinds of things that um, I know. I can't think right now. Crystal Vision has another version that they're that they uh, that's a little bit less expensive, um, and I'm just kind of excited to see in this AI world what we can do with glasses and things like that. Brendan, you wanted to jump back in? Sure. Yeah, um, I also wanted to include, and I actually just thought of it. Um, I think the potential is limitless, right? The potential is limitless for any type of AI or any type of um, technology like that. It really is amazing. And I think that, you know, um, if you add a camera, let's say, to some, side, some sort of um, device, you, instead of holding the device, um, you, you can be hands-free, which is amazing. And then that can be all included in the goggles or the glasses. But I think that will take time to develop. Um, I mean, you know, it's such small, you know, you really need to have a lot of power in such a small space, like a, a goggle or a glass, but I think that will improve. It'll continue to improve. I mean, think about how, where the iPhones have come. So, you know, I think over time, you know, we'll get there. It's just going to take some time. And I think it'll make, it'll really improve life as we know it. So, Yeah. I know the one thing that I've wanted for a very, very long time is the OrCam My Eye. Um, is actually able to do, you can train it for a small library of facial recognition so that when you, when somebody walks into your office and if you have it like on the stem of your glasses, it's not a full glasses itself, that it will tell you who's walking, who's coming into your office. And I've always thought with the there students in and out of right. my office, yeah. that would be really exciting for somebody who doesn't recognize faces until they speak to me. Um, to have something that could tell me, oh, you know, X, Y, and Z students just entered your office um, would just be amazing. They, they, but I agree with you. The, the, uh, the options are limitless with where AI is going and uh, the, the things getting smaller and more faster and, and smarter. With that being said, What's our next question? All right. It's uh, David Brady from New York, New York, asking, I have an Avio 2x2 two two USB Type A connector and a modern Mac with USB-C connectors. Can I adapt it down or use a hub? Go ahead, Mitchell. Uh, I'm using a hub. Uh, I'm using a OWC hub. And they're big. Uh, they call it just simply the Thunderbolt uh, hub. Uh, has all types of uh, USB type connectors on the back. It's got the A, it's got the C, it's got the Thunderbolt, it's got them all. So um, that solves the problem for uh, matching up something uh, that might electrically not work with a little uh, tab or adapter cable. John Edelson. And I uh, agree with Mitch. Um, what I'm holding here is a little adapter. This one happens to be the reverse. It does USB-C to A but I really don't prefer these little adapters and OWC, which makes the hub that uh, Mitch talked about makes a little short cable that has the USB a to uh, female to USB C male. And the advantage of that, it, the, the device that you have there, your two by two 
has a little short cable on it. When you put a, an adapter like this at the end, then the you have a lever and it's a, could be a potentially damaging to your your uh, connector. So having a little pigtail, as they call it, uh, works. And I, when I'm dealing with audio and microphones plugged into my computer, I'd like to have those directly connected to the computer if the ports are available. Yes, um, I'm on a M1 MacBook Pro at the moment that is connected to a CalDigit hub. And the Behringer Bigfoot is actually a USB-A. And I have it on a little, and I can't grab it at the moment because you'd lose my audio, but it's just a little piece where it's um, USB-A to USB-C. And it works well when I'm uh, getting power from the either the CalDigit or directly from the MagSafe. But I find it's a little bit less reliable when I have to get power via a, a, a straight USB-C. Um, so things to think about. Mitchell, you had another comment? Yes, yeah, actually, uh, Mickey mentions uh, in event chat that the uh, USB audios are just USB 2.0 devices. So there's no uh, inconsistencies. It'll fall back to the standard. Very good. Thank you, Mickey. Um, what would we, what would we do without our Mickey? Um, next question. From John Fisher in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. I recently lost a good deal of hearing range in my left ear. Can my AirPods Pro 2 be tuned to compensate? And what about non-Apple headphones? Well, a really interest. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, just jumping to the question here. Yes, that actually is a really good question. So from my understanding, kind of depends on your level of hearing loss. Um, I don't know the specific use and how that would work with your um, your headphones and your hearing loss. For amplification, it would probably be fine, but I'm not sure. I don't I don't know how that would work specifically. But in general, some people have different hearing losses, so it still does help them. Um, depends on what if you have damage to your ear or cochlea. That's kind of a different story. Um, it won't amplification won't help. You're missing some things, so it really kind of depends on your hearing loss whether that would solve your problem. Um, for general hearing loss, I mean, I think there's potential that might help. Um, it really, you know, cause it's getting it closer to the ear, getting the sound closer to the ear, but yeah, I, I don't know specifically to your situation. Yes. Thank you. And he brings up a very good point. I believe that was Brendan. Um, but every situation is different. And as I as I've said many, many times on this program, you, what works for one person does not necessarily work for everyone. So ex try things, experiment, and let us know what worked for you. We can speak from our own experiences, but that doesn't mean that what works for me works for everybody. Um, I'm sitting here literally with a Macintosh in front of me and a um, Microsoft a Dell PC to my right, because there are things with the screen readers and the screen magnifiers that one website works on an Apple product better. There are certain things that I can only do with a PC. And that was a real learning curve for me personally. So yeah. Um, and once you find something, um, John, please reach back out and, or yeah, John, and please reach back out and let us know what worked for you because our collective knowledge is always better than um, doing it by yourself. And this is a community. Next question. From Vincent Alvarez in Bellingham, Washington, what kind of technology do park rangers use in the field? I think we have the one person uniquely qualified to answer this question, John Edelson. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Vincent. I, I will uh, give my disclaimer. I'm a, a volunteer for the California State Parks, and the project I volunteer with is called Ports, Parks Online Resources for Students and Teachers. 
And prior to COVID, this was a way that students in California could get access to California parks through electronic field trips. And we started with a green screen studio and we had a remote camera where the elephant seals were. And then we would, via video conferencing, have a park interpreter slash ranger in California. We call it rangers doing these field trips interpreters. And that would be with a classroom. Well, COVID changed that. Uh, we went to many more individual homes. We did a parks cast. So if you go to www.ports-ca.us, you could see the sort of electronic field trips. So the technology that our uh, interpreter rangers use, it's the same sort of things for electronic, uh, for our video conferencing here. They need good audio. They're usually outside now doing it remotely. So we have Bluetooth headsets and we've we've tried any number of them. Um, and I could I could put in Discord sort of list of what ones we went through. And a lot of that is personal preference for the interpreter. What sounds better for them because they also need to hear remotely. So the Bluetooth headsets to get the audio. For our cameras, we're usually out in the field either with an iPhone or with an iPad. Sometimes they'll do a Surface computer or a, a Mac. But the the cameras that they're using are typically an iPad. And uh, in terms of technology, probably the more complicated technology is what sort of tripods or mounts that we have so that the interpreter can actually be on a Zoom conference, talking to a classroom, but take that iPad and all get it down to a tide pool or be able to uh, aim it up at a, a tree. And so that's the technology that we use for our field trips. To talk about technology, if we say technology in the field, <laughs> I think their binoculars are technology because they're looking for things to be able to see and talk to their teachers. We have uh, one electronic field trip, which uh, is on a kayak. So on that, the kayak is the technology. We have a started with GoPro cameras, but we have uh, other cameras that we could drop underwater so they could look at the kelp forest. Uh, we do electronic field trips from underwater. So we have uh, a, a submergible camera, HDMI cable up. Uh, and so there's lots of different technologies that the California State Parks use to be able to let students across California, but really they go worldwide, people who would not have the ability to ex access a state park and they want to learn about it, the technology allows us to do that outreach. Uh, the national parks, and I'm sure your park system up in Washington State also does similar sort of things. Go ahead, Brendan. Yeah, that's very cool. I think that's a great idea. Um, but just a suggestion, just kind of a thought. I'm wondering how um, we can, like if a deaf park ranger, if they were to be deaf and want to be a park ranger, I'm wondering how they would do that, how they would make that accessible to everyone. Just a, just a thought, you know, just, you know, I mean, when you're doing something remote like that, you know, you can't text or I'm wondering how the technology would work, you know, out in the field when it's a deaf park ranger. But just just you don't have to answer. Just kind of food for thought. No, I, I think you bring up a very good point. And actually, I'm really excited to be working with the state parks because they really are looking at accessibility and accessibility, you know, distance uh, is a accessibility. But it's not only for a ranger to be able to do a remote broadcast, but for to do better access at the state park. So you, if you physically go to a park, lots of times you'll see a board or an example, and then they'll have braille. Uh, they'll have uh, various uh, listening devices to make things better. Um, and now they're doing a lot of physical things. So here in Monterey at the Silmar State Park, they've made... Um, ramps and accessibility so that your wheelchair doesn't get caught in the sand. And I think this is the uh, is an exciting uh, area for this, the parks and anyone who has a space to figure out how do you make it accessible for more. And what I've seen with the state parks, particularly the work they've been doing here, is, you know, curve cuts were made to make things better for wheelchairs, but 
everybody has a roller cart going to and from an airport says thank you. And the same thing has been happening now as they start making things more accessible in the state parks, that it really is for everyone and makes the experience better and encourages more people to go to the park. So um, the the state parks has taken this very seriously. They've they've always, for their websites, made it accessible. They've always tried to strive for that, but they're really taking it to the next level. Thank you, John. And I know that you've been very much a advocate and a um, ally for all of us in this community at different times. And there have been different things that have that you've done. And uh, that is the beauty of a community that the mission statement is a global conversation where no one is left out. Well, Laura, you know, you and I've had a lot of conversations of, you know, tips and tricks with technology. Um, I'm a, a retired professor and failing retirement. So, you know, once an educator, it's hard not to be. Uh, and I think that, that is what the Office Hours community has done and what we did with Educational Hour during the early days of the COVID and trying to continue to do now is to help people do their job better and make better access for our students. And when you say students, it doesn't necessarily have to be formal education. Um, there, there's a lot that goes on that is, uh, you know, there's casual education, there's awareness. And I think that's all is important as, and I know Erin's here, she's a classroom teacher. Um, and, but it's, it's it's a it's an awareness and a mindset as much as it is the tools and technology tips. Yeah, I guess I guess I use student because I I I think of myself as a student. <laughs> you, you move between student and teacher. I always said I think I'm doing life. Uh, everyone tries to grade you, but I'm just trying to do pass fail. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, and it's just it's it's so much of a you know working at a university myself. I I had to get that that everything is teaching and learning. Um, just because we aren't giving credit for the social emotional and um, adult learning, the adulting learning that they're that the that these students are doing at the university level doesn't mean it's not just as important. And that you you can craft it into the other lessons that you teach both in and out of the classroom. Next question. And it's from you, Laura, from Beaumont, Texas. Do any of our panels fear that technology is replacing necessary skills? Brendan? Well, as someone who has seen a lot of things go on throughout the years, uh, invisible, you know, eventually things are going to change. It's inevitable. Uh, you just have to move things around. But it seems to be that they'll always find something new to train and, and they'll always have a new plan. There'll be something different. So if you remember, like the cars, the, the factory, the cars are like, oh, no, that's going to, you know, robots are going to replace the workers. Well, no, they, we still have workers there with the car industry, and we just have to train people better to do better things instead of just routine things. Uh, you know, maybe something better for the cars. Maybe they have to look at something different. You know, add something to the workers to add to a different skills. Just, just kind of envision that. And like AI, people are panic about AI. Oh, AI is going to replace my job, but no, it's perfect because humans still can have to program the AI. It doesn't think for itself. So my thought is, you know, it'll help us improve life. Some jobs that maybe can become automated will be, but then they'll move those people to something else. That will happen. And that's been happening in, in previous generations. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, I'd like to uh, agree with what Brendan just said and also say as a voiceover artist, um, I'm always concerned that uh, there'll be no longer have a need for what it is that I do. But I think there's a lot of stuff available that AI can do in between what I do as a voiceover artist 
and what a device could be doing to communicate with people, either just telling them uh, what the temperature is or turn left here or whatever. I think that's a, that's an appropriate use of the technology. As to replacing, I don't think it's going out of its way to replace me as a voiceover person because there'll always be a need for a bespoke uh, voiceover person that knows how to put a certain amount of emphasis on certain things. But um, to answer your question, not too concerned. Go ahead, Aaron. So, Mitchell, I have to completely agree with you in the sense that I listen to audiobooks constantly. I have read 97 books this year because of audiobooks and speeding it up, obviously. But something that I've noticed is that if I can't get my audiobook through Audible or through my library system and I want to use Alexa or something similar, the voice is so terrible, I can't read it. I can't listen to it anymore. It's not worth it. Yeah, that's the the uh, the subtleties of a live reader uh, doing it because there's micro pauses and a pantameter that's associated with reading that only, well, at least now, only a human can do. So I agree with you there. Thank you. More than welcome. And then, of course, I have to pull in my third grade educator hat here for a moment in that. Many of my students have started to lose the ability to physically write or print correctly because of the fact that they're using their devices so often. Now, my thought is as long as they can sign their name to a check and at some point, as long as they can read their own writing, I'm not incredibly against it due to all the technology that they're growing up with, to be honest. Because so much of the technology, besides it being um, very helpful for students and it's neater, it helps with accessibility for so many students. I know so many of my students struggle to read and to write, but they have these amazing thoughts and ideas. So when they can click the microphone and just speak into it and have a friend edit out the ums and the things that don't belong, it makes it so much easier for them. So while yes, I do fear sometimes some technology is replacing some skills like telling time on an analog clock, overall, I feel like technology is only going to help us throughout whether you're in kindergarten or in adult education or beyond. Yes, I agree. Um, I'm going to go to Michael in one second, but I just wanted to say that the one fear that I have is that there are school districts and thought, trains of thought about teaching visually impaired and blind students braille now, but you go to every public place, every, everything. And what are the, what are the accessible signs? They are braille. They don't talk to you. Um, our, our phones are getting better. But still, if we lose electric, if you, if your battery isn't charged, it's a it's a very simple skill. And I, I'd be interested to hear from Michael and Brendan. Um, are they still teaching lip reading? What is there something like that going on in the in the deaf community and other places where you aren't getting the um, like to the, those younger than than those of us sitting here aren't learning something that they maybe need. Um, that if we lost electricity, if we lost our computers, that would not would be a disservice to that population. And it's actually an honest question. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, Michael here. Just waiting for the video to split. Okay, great. Uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, two places where I think we want to talk about here and for with AI, as many of you know, the deaf community is huge. It's bigger than you can imagine. You have deaf people, you have late deaf and you have hard of hearing. They're all part of the deaf community. And then down the road, there'll be more than 1 billion uh, in 20 years from now who have some sort of hearing loss. Now, people who are born deaf 
are different from people who are hearing who become deaf later. There's two different avenues there. Now, I was born deaf, and I am very, I hate to use the word term, but I am privileged. Uh, my parents both became teachers at the two after, after they found out I was deaf. So they invested so much time in me. You know, and I'm grateful for that, but it's not, anyways, putting that aside, <laughs> that's another topic for another day. Now, uh, I was just playing with AI. And I, I, I can read and write pretty well myself. It's not perfect, but I'm probably one, uh, probably about one, uh, less than 1% of deaf and hard of hearing who can read and write. Now about 90, I would say 99, 98% can't really write well. Maybe they're writing at third grade level or below. So I was just playing with AI. Uh, and I've been teaching for 25 years. And you know, I, I've been teaching for deaf, uh, deaf students to help them improve their writing. So I wrote like my students wrote. And I say, me, no like means I don't like something. And the AI said, it sounds like you are bored in a meeting. And it says, no, me, no, understand. It says, wow, you're speaking like a caveman. And it's like, I'm like, okay, this doesn't really fit and works for those people who are at that level. So that's that's one, one thing. And then the second thing, technology. Technology is one area where I'm really, really frustrated with. There are many big companies out there, Google, Apple, the gambit of the companies who are making improvements on technology. And, but they always forget about accessibility in that arena. They do reach out to say well-known organizations for influence and advice, but that organization maybe not know, maybe they don't know enough about deafness or blindness and they just happen to have a friend who knows a friend and they talk to someone and that's just not good enough. So that's where we really, that's that's my fear for the future of technology is that ongoing, not uh, having awareness of accessibility. Yes, thank you. Um, Brendan, you wanted to come back and add some more to the conversation? Yeah. Uh, I won't, I won't go too long, I promise. <laughs> so just to add to what Michael said, culturally deaf, uh, you know, or if you're from a different country, it's, it's worse in other countries because the USA is, we're lucky to have a lot of things, a lot of support, but some are still not there, not perfect. Now with AI, another way, it could help is in the future, if it recognizes sign language, or I know there's one company that's uh, translating English into sign to help those people who need that. And that's for those people, it'll help them and help in their life. It'll enable more people to have more access at different levels. But for myself and like Michael, both were 100% deaf and, and were deaf, born deaf and everything. But other people, they don't access companies like Apple as, as well as we can. They just can't. And, and I'm lucky because, you know, I thank God for my parents and everything they've given me growing up and having that access with that communication. So it's just, it depends on their level. Thank you. This has been a great discussion and it's uh, kind of an ongoing conversation as we do these accessibility Saturdays. But Mitchell, what's our next question? It's from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. Paul wants to know, uh, the rewind.ai app gives you perfect memory, quote unquote. 
Is this a possible cure for Alzheimer's and or dementia in old age, or is there a better solution? Only runs on Apple Silicon Max. John Prado. Not sure it's going to be a solution for for those types of of people. However, uh, Rewind.ai, you're going to see these type of features end up in the operating system. So Microsoft has already mentioned these type of features built directly into the OS, and Apple will follow suit. If you opt in, it's going to know everything about you. It's going to know all your contacts that you put in. It's going to know everything about your calendar. It's going to know how you write, and it's going to be a co-pilot. That's what Microsoft calls it to assist you in productivity in your life moving forward. So look for those features built directly into the OS. Brendan, you had wanted to come in on this? Yes, I think that's a wonderful question. Um, I actually just spoke with someone about this recently, and um, we were just talking about this. Um, I don't have an Apple, but I was working on Windows at the time, and um, you know, I was forced to use Apple, um, and I wasn't, you know, that was a new thing for me. But anyway, so moving forward, I'm wondering how that will assist with 7B. I think you know that's going to move forward. But anyway, that aside. Um, you know, as a deaf person, also as a person that has ADHD, um, there's so many problems and things to remember, you know, this will really help and aid in that a lot, because oftentimes there are things that I'm excited about looking forward to, and I just, they're out of sight, out of mind, and I forget them. So I think this technology would really assist in that, especially when it comes to work, um, for meetings and things like that. So I do remember, I think, oh, what was that? And then, you know, I have to have a note taker and oftentimes they don't want to provide a note taker or uh, I'll need a note taker and a sign language interpreter at the same time. But with this, it's already taken care of. So it's much easier to use the technology. So just my two cents about that. But and also as a deaf person and as a person with ADHD, absolutely. I think this is a great technology to look forward to. Very good. Thank you. Next question. From Douglas Carmichael. What would there be any Parsec class Mac OS remote access solutions that can work on an iPad Pro? Parsec is incredible, but it doesn't have an iOS client. Oh, good question. Um, I know Apple has their own remote desktop solution. Um, so, and I don't know, I know I'm on a Mac that is remotely managed by my university and they're struggling with this right now. Um, so that might be, this might be one to jump into discord and ask. Um, next question. Uh, from Gordon Lake in Los Angeles, California. What technologies do you believe are not moving fast enough and how would we benefit from faster development? Go ahead, Brendan. Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think accessibility, features and accessibility, I wish that would move a little faster. Technology, I don't think it's moving fast enough. Um, you know, they don't really understand the need for the world to become more accessible. Um, you know, I posted in this um, a message about this before. And, um, you know, with just, um, I posted that. Um, and um, I, I, don't know, I don't know if you're familiar with ABCs um, from 33 years ago, and we're still waiting. We still have the same games, the same, you know, software and games that learn the ABCs. So, you know, I really think, I mean, I really wish we had more, um, but I noticed that we really could move faster um, with Meta. You know, with Meta, they have new apps coming out. Um, Thread is their new app, right? So there's a lot of people that really have an issue with that. So it's been years and years and years, and we're still being ignored in the market, right? So um, we're still, you know, really, they're not listening to our needs um, and other things come first. And that's very frustrating with AI technology and glasses. You really, I think we could have done that yesterday. I mean, I think, you know, the disability population is being ignored, deaf, blind, whatever. I think, you know, we're always put to the back burner. John Adelson. I think this is an interesting question because the challenge with technology might not be the technology, but the ability for humans to use it and adjust to it. So uh, technology moves a lot faster than than our uh, ability to accept them. Uh, when I was a university professor back in the day, pre-television uh, screens and computers, there was a thing called the overhead projector, which would let you write while you were looking to students and project on the wall and allow professors 
not to have to turn their back. I see Aaron grinning there, turn their back uh, to their classes, which I don't know in college, but I know in, in uh, my experience in high school that you never want to turn your back on your students. It's dangerous. Um, but that technology for overhead transparencies took 30 years to move from bowling alleys where it was first introduced to when it became a technology in the educational settings. But the technologies, I think, aren't moving fast enough. And we've seen examples of it as that's in terms of medicine. Uh, you could see how quickly the vaccine was created and some of the movement that we see in the medical field. So there are technologies related to, you know, how are we going to deal with uh, pollution? How are we going to deal with global warming? So those technologies aren't moving fast enough. But I think some of the technologies that touch human beings, uh, they need to understand the speed at which uh, people would, will adapt. Uh, I never really did adapt to typing on a telephone with my thumbs, but my, uh, my children were really good at it. Thank you so much and yes uh, there are there are i think sometimes as much as technology evolving fast enough it's a matter of making sure that the communication and what we call standards are really standards and um everybody's on the same page i know with the wcag um i'm going to take just a moment here and kind of go off on a rant but there's 2.1, they're looking at bringing 2.2 out and there are still companies, software companies in education that will not remediate past WCAG 2.0 AA, which is relatively frustrating when you look at it and go, um, that was 10 years ago. So just my two cents on it. Next question. Tony Mobley in Noonan, Georgia, asking, can Dr. Idelson share the schedule of upcoming ports scheduled for the new school year? Will signing be a part of the future? Well, the, the place to find the schedule, the ports project has a number of things during summer, but again, it's port stands for parks, resources for students and teachers, and many students are on their summer vacation. But if you go to www.ports, Dash ca .us. So that's standing for Parks Online Resources for Students and Teachers, dash CA for California, dot US for the US. You can see past programs that were our public broadcast, and you can see all the different uh, topics that we have for teachers to sign up for. But the uh, schedule for the public pre presentations will be on that website, and teachers schedule their own individual sessions with their interpreters. Our ports program is really a one-on-one, -on -one, essentially one an interpreter working with a teacher in one classroom. Uh, in those cases, they do do things to be meet accommodations when needed. Um, there's not signing regularly on every program, but we, again, the state parks are very actively making sure they're providing accessibility in every way that they can. Yes, thank you. Um, and the the website has been shared into the Mukana chat. Um, thanks to uh, our wonderful Chad, who's in, always in the background, uh, keeping us uh, all straight. Um, I'm going to ask Mitchell to go ahead and read this next question, um, and then we'll kind of discuss it. All right, sounds good. Dave Troutman from Edmonton, Canada. As is, uh, do accessibility features help able-bodied people as much as people with disabilities? Go ahead, Brendan. Yes, definitely. They absolutely can. I think those features will help anyone, really. Um, deaf people with captioning, um, that helps everyone, right? Um, if it's loud or there's a train, you can actually read the caption. Sometimes you can't hear it. So, that, of course, that would help anyone. English as a second language, English users that use English as a second language. So, any of that would be helpful to anyone. Um, any type of like... Um, Transcripts, when things are typed out or captioned um, in transcript, that would help anyone um, to kind of level the playing field and know exactly what's going on. So um, if it's something that helps me, I think it would help everyone. 
that uses those services, any of those features. Um, I think really people that use wheelchair ramps, um, that was one feature that it's it's accessible to everyone, right? People using bicycles, people using strollers, um, anyone that's using anything with wheels. So I think that would help lots of people. Go ahead, Mandy. I can give a few examples of instances when I use the accessibility feature called voiceover on my iPhone to get myself out of a jam. And it's meant to be a screen reader for individuals with vision impairment. And it's available on Apple devices, including iPhone, iPad, iPod Touch, and Mac. It's basically, if you think of text to speech. Uh, one of those times was a submit button that I could not find visually when I was renewing my registration, vehicle registration in Ohio. And it, it was essentially invisible. If you think about maybe a white text on a white background, the same shade where there was no, either there no contrast at all, but then I turned on voiceover and I found the button and I was able to finish what I was trying to do. And other times, Another time there was, it's, I found this, the, the other examples were all date pickers where you're, it's like a spin box that Mac uses or Apple uses, or you can get this on anything where you're changing the month, the day or the year, and you're kind of scrolling through those choices. And I could not scroll to subsequent months later in the year or dates and I hopped into voiceover and performed the tack that way. And it was, that's how the only way I could get it to work. So I often will um, train individuals how to use voiceover and it totally changes the way you use your device. So it's a single tap isn't going to open an app. It's just going to tell you what an app is and a double tap will activate it. So there's uh, just some things to know about using some of these features that is different from regular use. Brendan, go ahead. Yes, and I wanted to add something as well. I did remember this. I mean, normally um, people, you know, they can do anything if they're having a reading issue, like they're using goggles. I mean, I'm 50 years old, so sometimes I need to use my glasses, right? So I'll use glasses and if I don't have them with me, I'll have those other features that can enlarge the print, so that will help as well. So there's lots of applications for people um, other than people with disabilities. Um, also, like if there's a, some sort of um, railing, you know, if you're tired, of course, you know, you can use that railing to lean on. Um, you know, so there are physical features that would help as well. You can hold onto the railing, even if you don't physically need that. It is nice when you're tired for any person, right? Yes, absolutely. And I think we're going to go ahead and take one more question here. So Mitchell, what's our last question for this hour? Last one from Liberty White in Atlanta, Georgia. Can you suggest a good resource to create faceless videos? Think seminar presentation from a script without having to use the author's voice? I actually don't know. Um, I know some of the different AIs are trying to do this. Um, I know there's a famous actor that sold his voice to a model, to an AI model, so that I want to say it was James Earl Jones, maybe? Um, Darth, the original Darth Vader? I don't remember for sure right now. Um, but yeah, um, that's... I'm sure there's something out there. I'm just not as up on this. Um, John Predator, do you know which AI it was that that happened with? Brendan, go ahead. I do remember that. I remember different websites having, I remember there were two or three different AI websites that had were able to make a presentation without, like with an avatar and a voice. Um, and that's a good question without the face, but I, I think the technology, you know, I think that, that they have that, you know, I think they can adjust it and then make it whatever they need to do, you know, to make it work so they can take things and kind of create, be creative with that. Um, there's like different, like lots of different applications for that. Um, and really they can kind of add all of that in and make one single product. Yes. Um, thank you. And we are just about at the top of our hour. And um, Tim is going to, Tim David's going to come in and uh, have a conversation and lead our conversation on neurodiversity. Good morning. 
Good morning, afternoon, and evening, depending on where you're joining from. And we're really excited about today's conversation. And I'm really excited to have Albert Kim uh, join us today. And uh, I'll let him introduce himself uh, in just a minute. But I wanted to, to talk a little bit about um, what we're calling Accessibility Saturdays. So we're now um, a, a few weeks in. So we've we had an episode where we talked about uh, sign language and, um, you know, interpreting and related topics. And you can see part of, uh, you know, part of the result of those conversations and even a follow up kind of on how this this part is done. Um, we're excited to have this as part of our our calls each week. And uh, then we did a an episode on on language translations. Um, today we're going to move into uh, neurodivergent, neuro neurodiversity, and uh, mental health topics. Um, this is a, a very important topic for a number of reasons, which you're going to see. And, and Albert is a, a, a sought-after resource, um, presents at a number of conferences and companies around the world. So, looking forward to this conversation. So, Albert, welcome. And um, to start, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and and tell us where you're joining from, also? Yeah, hello team. Uh, thank you for having me. So I'm a digital accessibility consultant uh, for accessibility innovation, uh, providing accessibility consulting, training, auditing, user testing, and design reviews for various clients, uh, ranging from start startups to Fortune 500 companies. I'm also an invited expert for a World Wide Web Consortium and uh, a member of the Cognitive and Learning Disabilities uh, Accessibility Task Force where I contribute to the development of uh, guidelines and techniques for making web content accessible to people with chronic mental health conditions and cognitive learning disabilities. Uh, I also founded a, a, a 501c3 nonprofit organization called Accessibility Next Gen. Uh, it's a peer support community where we help each other grow our knowledge in digital accessibility uh, for, for beginners. Um, I'm I'm based in LA, but I'm currently uh, uh, joining this call from South Korea. Excellent, thanks, Albert. And would you mind sharing a little bit about your mental health diagnosis, and and also maybe tell us a little bit about did that bring any struggles or stigma to your work and your personal life? Yeah, of course. Um, so I identify myself as a as neurodivergent. Um, some of my diagnosis uh, that I live with our ADHD, uh, dyslexia, um, OCD, generalized anxiety disorder, uh, major depression and PTSD. Um, and, and the journey of, of getting all those diagnoses was just really challenging, right? Uh, it wasn't just the, uh, just the stigma itself, right? Uh, the by nature mental health, uh, uh treatment, uh, it takes a long time, right? Um, so, it's it's hard to get diagnosed quickly uh, and accurately uh, by nature. So it took me almost like 10 years and uh, 10 different doctors, right? I went through clinical psychologists. I went through a neuropsychologist where I did a, you know, two days of a six hour long tests. Um, I went through marriage, family counselor, psychiatrists. So this whole, this whole journey wasn't easy uh, getting all my diagnosis. But definitely there was some sort of a, a feeling of relief when I was getting diagnosed because I felt like things were getting more uh, clear to me uh, it, because I used to feel that, oh, I, maybe I have some kind of error in my personality, right? I felt like it was my uh, personal problem, not medical condition, right? Um, so I was really criticizing myself a lot. But uh, after getting diagnosis, it was um, more exp explainable and um, uh, understandable. So, um, but the journey wasn't easy and it took a long time. Also one challenge um, of, of the mental health uh, treatment is in the United States, for example, is, is that um, uh, all, in order for doctors to get paid, uh, by the insurance company, they have to diagnose something. Uh, so that becomes a challenge because after first, you know, one hour session, it's hard for doctors to uh, thoroughly 
uh, know everything, right? And 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 completely diagnose, but they have to diagnose something to get paid. So that also made it really challenging as well, you know, confusing sometimes. And um, and I think all my diagnosis came from uh, just uh, my a, a lot of environmental factors or, or from my upbringing as well as genetic factors, right? Um, like I was raised mostly by a single mom, uh, family with uh, domestic violence, uh, victim of domestic violence. Uh, I'm first generation uh, in my family to go to uh, school, get any education, first generation in my family to live in the United States, uh, came from low income family. I'm also military veteran, um, things like that. Um, so I think it kind of uh, explains, but um, also I think it, it wasn't just the diagnosis um, but the stigma towards mental health, uh, because uh, I come from Asian Asian family, right? Korean Korean American family. So uh, in my culture, mental health is hugely stigmatized, and um, so there was a lot of family opposition, right? Uh, when I first said that, oh, I I want to start getting mental health therapy and treatments, um, and not only that, but after starting the treatments. Uh, it was hard for me to uh, take the courage to start medication, right? That was another challenge because I was worried. Oh, what if that, like, what's going to that uh, do that? Uh, what What's the medicine going to do to my my brain? Um, I had all this uh, um, internalized stigma uh, subconsciously. Um, so it, it, it was a really challenging experience overall. And I think that, um, I think that, the, one of the reasons that contributed to the, the challenge was because of the stigma. Um, um, and, and, and I wanted to mention that um, I think the wrong image, the incorrect image uh, that is portrayed in, in media towards mental health also contributed to that. Uh, for example, such as um, uh, when I was thinking about getting mental health therapy, um, oftentimes in media, uh, mental health is, portrayed as a in the news where uh they're uh as a like a crazy or maniac or serial killer or mass shooter or psychopath or you know something very severe but mental health is a lot more than just you know mass shooter right like there's a lot more to it but and it's it's a very uh three-dimensional uh very um complex and, and and there's a spectrum right but um and I feel like uh, mental getting mental health treatment was um, kind of uh, a, a satanized in a way, and um, or I was I also was afraid. Oh, what if I go seek for mental health and uh, treatment and then um, get locked down in a mental health hospital and I cannot come out uh, or, or leave my life anymore? It, it, these were all the fears that I, I realized. Well, it wasn't just, it wasn't just me, but a lot of um, uh, my my friends who are also going through a similar struggle and uh, the journey uh, were experiencing and and very valid fears um, because the the image that we often see in in media about getting mental health treatment or talking about mental health is oftentimes very severe uh, cases only and it and many times they are not accurate for example and and a, a lot of times people um, it's either very serious. Uh, or very light, um, right? Like in the media when it's covered. For example, on the light side, uh, when people talk about OCD, uh, they would just colloquially say, um, oh, like I, I'm super clean and organized, so I must have OCD. Like I'm OCD about it. I'm a perfectionist, so I'm OCD. But OCD is a lot more than just being a perfectionist or cleaning right and there's many different kinds of obsessions right it's not just cleaning right for me i don't i don't wash my hands 10 times right like i my ocd is about completion so there's completely different layers to um mental health but i feel like in media it's oftentimes uh uh, portrayed in only certain image, right? Um, or people colloquially saying, oh, I must, uh, like, I feel like I'm going to get PTSD from this. But like, oh, I need some mental boost right now. So I, where's my Adderall, you know? Um, like things like this. Like, I feel like um, 
what what these kind of uh, colloquial, casual usage of medical terms in a careless manner in media uh, do is it actually undermines the actual challenge that people go through. It, it undermines the difficulty so that when I have to ask for accommodation in, in jobs or schools, uh, no one takes me seriously when I talk about mental health, right? Oh, like, are you trying to get ahead of other people? Are you trying to cheat? You know, accommodation is not cheating, right? And oftentimes it's very hard to um, get accommodations, especially for invisible disabilities like this, because, uh, you know, uh, oftentimes uh, people ask for, where's your medical document? Where's where's the official document? Um, and, um, and, and that's very challenging. So, um, and, and the treatment and, and access to doctors and getting all the diagnosis is not, um, it's not accessible and it's not easy for everyone, right? You, not everyone has the same access. Um, so it, I think it really adds on. And what's the reasonable accommodation, right? And a, a lot of times people ask, oh, like, you know, we'll provide reasonable accommodation for your needs. But like, I always have to fight for it, you know? Um, and, uh, oh, we've provided these accommodations before, but we've never done that. So we don't think that we can do it. But, you know, it's it's not one size fits all as well. So there's a lot of uh, challenge to it. And, um, and, and that kind of adds more stress and loneliness and isolation uh, during the uh, journey of of mental health uh, for for uh, neurodivergent uh, people like me, Albert, can you 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 touched on you know a lot of folks just kind of self diagnosing and probably as a as a cultural you know in other words they they probably don't have that. Can you talk a little bit about how someone might get diagnosed or and the importance of that. You you kind of already touched on that, but can you just dive into how important it would be to actually get an official diagnosis so that people know? Yeah, I, I feel like um uh official diagnosis is important, but as I was saying, um the the access to the medical uh help is is not equally provided. Um uh, it's and 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 mental health and uh, especially mental health diagnosis, it takes a long time to get full diagnosis. Um, and it's layer by layer. Um, so it, it, so it's expensive by, you know, long-term medical uh, uh, treatment and diagnosis, it's expensive and you need to find the right fit with the uh, right doctor. You need to find the right doctor and stuff. And, um, but if I were to have a, a, a quick advice, I, I personally recommend um, trying to one thing that that one thing to keep in mind when you are looking for a, a mental health professional is that um, try to maybe it's it's safer for you to think that um, sometimes we we think that oh because they work in uh, mental health uh, they must have they must not have that, uh, bias towards mental health, but that's actually not true. Um, I, I think I, I've uh, learned my lessons uh, while going through the uh, treatment and looking for different doctors. And um, so being aware of that, and uh, when you go through uh, different doctors, make sure if you have health insurance, in-network is always gonna cost much less. less. Um, and for me, if you have, if your uh, symptoms are pretty severe, I, I always recommend going to a university hospital psychiatry department because that's really helpful because um, usually university uh, hospital uh, hospitals have team of doctors. So um, if one doctor is not the right fit for you, then they can easily refer you to another doctor rather than you having to research another person again, right? So I think that's kind of, a, um, and also you can have multiple doctors depending on your conditions, right? Clinical psychologists, therapists, and psychiatrists, and those doctors will work together to, to, uh, to uh, work with you, right? So um, I think that's why I, I oftentimes recommend uh, hosp uh, university hospitals to um, 
to get the diagnosis and uh, see uh, how, how things go. And also be aware that um, there's a difference between clinical psychologists and uh, therapists, right? Clinical psychologists are more specialized. So if you have already, if you already know your symptoms and if you already know that uh, your diagnosis is, for example, OCD, you can specifically look for such expertise in clinical psychologists, right? Rather than generalists, right? Um, things like that, uh, I think are pretty uh, uh, important to uh, know. Excellent, thank you. Can, it, can you just touch on what is the status of the mental health crisis uh, around the world? Yeah, this is a uh, um, uh, this is really important uh, question. Uh, thank you for asking. You know, I think that the rate of suicide among teenagers in the United States, for example, has been increasing for several years, right? And, and in the U.S., suicide is the leading cause of premature death among teenagers. It's the second leading cause, right? Um, it's not cancer. It's not, you know, accident, car accident or anything, but it's the suicide. And uh, according to the uh, National Alliance on uh, Mental Illness, one of the most well-known uh, mental health organization, uh, nearly 20% of high school students report serious thoughts of suicide. That's one in five high school students, right? Uh, thinking of suicide. And out of that, uh, 9% have already made an attempt to take their lives. So this is a pretty severe number, and this has been rising, 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 right? And uh, just to, sometimes numbers kind of feel a little distant. So uh, just to give you a little personal experience, at my uh, university, uh, I went to uh, USC, University of Southern California, and um, in one semester in 2019, nine students have died. And um, about half um, was due to uh, suicide, as far as I, I remember. And um, uh, and the other uh, half was, I think, due to uh, accidental drug abuse. But a lot of people who go through mental health uh, challenges, they rely on street drugs. So it's not very uncommon. Uh, accidental drug abuse is very common among um, uh, people with mental health challenges as well. But so the school ended up uh, hosting a, like a town hall meeting and uh, like hundreds of students came in and school administrators were asking, hey, so, uh, um, you know, like we, we do recognize the problem here. It was nine student death is in one semester is severe, you know, like how can we make your student life much better? And then everyone in this, uh, in this, in this, in the host, in the whole meeting were uh, shouting out for better student health, mental health counseling office in school uh, with more staffs and treatment availability. Um, they used to have just one office for uh, student mental health uh, uh, counseling, but they uh, ended up renovating the entire uh, uh, student health center to make the whole, whole floor as a student health counseling uh, um, office. And um, interestingly, I went to, uh, USC Keck Medical Hospital, but um, they don't see any outside patients anymore because they are flooded with already in network within USC network, USC community already, right? Students, staffs, and that's already too much for them, right? Does that even make sense? There's two major uh, universities uh, in LA, Los Angeles, UCLA, USC, right? And um, and 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 there's hospitals for both of them. And uh, one of them is not seeing any outside patients anymore, only within USC Community Network. That's really, uh, uh, that tells a lot about how much um, there's a lack of resources out there and um, uh, how much, uh, the problem is getting more more uh, 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 epidemic and severe. Um, so especially in college students, the uh, suicide rate and uh, mental health problems have been just rising very fast. And um, and, and as we all know, we, we went through a COVID pandemic, right? And National Institutes of Health in 2021 study, nearly half of Americans surveyed reported recent symptoms of an anxiety or depressive disorder during COVID. That's one in like one in two, nearly half. 
And um, I know that currently, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, layoffs in tech industry and, you know, a lot of also because of the AI and, you know, a lot of the uh, replacement of workforce and things like that. And what I'm also afraid of is that um, historically, economic conditions and layoffs have been have have been directly uh, correlated with suicide rate. So uh, there was always a rise of suicide rates when there was a lot of layoffs. Um, so I'm kind of, uh, of also anticipating that the rates will uh, get even higher from, from this uh, the recent layoffs as well. Um, yeah. Thanks, Albert. Do you have some, some resources, one or two, that you can recommend um, you know, that people can go to learn more, to find out about uh, what they can do? Hmm. Well, um, there's so many resources out there, but I think, well, first of all, um, the organization that I just mentioned, NAMI, uh, which is which stands for a National Alliance on Mental Illness, is the biggest community uh, for uh, people who are going through mental health uh, struggles. So I highly recommend uh, checking that them out. Um, also, I think I, I'd like to share one thing really um, insightful from my experience is that mental health treatment itself was not enough for me. Because if you think about it, mental health treatment is just one hour per week usually. That's not enough. It's not enough support, right? So what I, uh, for me, what I found out was actually um, friends and, and finding community, right? Who are going through similar struggles as you. Um, and and uh, peer support, um, that was a huge help for me because um, um, when I hear about other people's struggles and how they went through different journeys and how they have overcome uh, different coping mechanisms people uh, adapt, uh, I learn as well, right? And I, I can also relate to a lot of the journeys. Um, so, and mental health treatment journey can be very lonely, uh, but, you know, when you have, find that such community, it's much uh, uh, less uh, uh, isolating. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, we're going to transition into uh, questions here, but I did want um, Laura to make a quick comment before we get into the uh, the questions. I just wanted to thank Albert for being here today. And um, so much of what you say, I resonate with. There are, and there are so many problems, but we've come so far with neurodiversity and mental health. Um, I think it's interesting that in this country, if you have a visual disability, you cannot have a learning disability, which I think is absolutely crazy um, because the accommodations for one not ne do not necessarily cover both. Um, at least the last time I looked up the guidelines, which admittedly has been a few years. Um, and also one of the things you talked about with the popular and the culturization of it, um, I could go down an entire rabbit hole. We could spend an entire hour on emotional support dogs versus psychiatric service dogs and the differences and why that's so important. But again, just thank you for being here today with us. I think the awareness is so important. Very good. So we'll we'll move over to the uh, uh, the questions that are lined up here. Albert, I'd love for you to to jump in on a few of these as well. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, with that, let's just jump right into the questions. So, uh, next question. Thank you, Tim. Andy Kokendorfer from Vieira, Florida, asks: How can poor audio quality from Zoom presenters negatively affect people with cognitive disabilities, the neurodiverse, and general mental health? Are there studies that you can point to? Brendan. <clears throat> yes, <clears throat> Brendan here. As a person, as a deaf person, of course, the quality really affects, you know, <clears throat> their mental health. And I'm sure you can imagine <clears throat> the stress, understanding what's being said, 
making sure you have accessibility through interpreter makes things worse. So, um, you know, try, you know, not everyone is able to be read clearly when you're using, you know, lip reading. So you can see how technology, sometimes the technology freezes up. Sometimes the person looks away when they're talking and can't read their lips. So there's lots of different challenges with audio, of course, and the interpreter has to hear well to be able to translate, right? So if the auto audio quality is poor, then the interpreter becomes nervous and it affects everyone, right? So um, that's something that happens as a person with ADHD. It makes me very anxious. All those challenges that, you know, happen due to poor audio and things just escalate quickly there. So um, I think all of those things impact that. Also, um, when it comes to people that are working hard to listen, right? Everyone has to try to struggle to hear. Um, some people are more sensitive to those things. And so, you know, it really kind of puts a spotlight on that. And when you're trying to understand, it makes it difficult on those people who are struggling. So um, as a person with ADHD, you know, that can be a struggle. Or um, let's say um, if you have, the, I think there's been some studies about this, but this specifically pertaining to audio, I, I don't think so. I think there's more general things like um, Zoom and ADHD. And I think they talked about that, but not really the audio, but just, just Zoom in general. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Brennan. And let's go over to Aaron. Right. So as someone with ADHD myself, I can tell a uh, very poor audio quality a lot better now, especially after listening to many episodes of Office Hours and having my ear be trained. Um, so there are a couple of the sites that I did find um, that I can post in the chat and up on Discord. But overall, the worse, the poorer the quality is for audio, whether it's a YouTube video, an audio book, or anything that you're listening to, your brain has to work up to 35% more to try to understand what is going on. And that is so draining. It is so draining, whether you're neurotypical or neurodivergent, it is so difficult to try to figure out what is being said. I think my personal opinion, and I think that's what's been say said on Office Hours frequently, I'd rather have a poorer video quality but amazing audio quality because I'd much rather listen to something and hear it accurately than see something accurately, but hear it all garbled. So I will post some of those links in the chat and in Mukana, but overall, the better the audio, the better it is for everyone. Thanks, Erin. Right. I think a lot of people misunderstand Zoom fatigue. Um, and they're not realizing what it's what's actually causing that. Uh, let's go over to John. Yes, uh, Zoom to fatigue. I think poor audio really does affect that and makes meetings very hard for us to tolerate them for a very long time. But uh, and I ditto with what Aaron said. But it's not only in Zoom. Really, audio quality affects everyone, and in physical classrooms and remote classrooms. So there are quite a few studies out about the issues of bad audio in classrooms. And if the audio is bad for some people who have a harder time processing it, it's difficult. But even if you have perfect hearing and no uh, disability, bad audio makes your head work harder and makes less cycles for understanding the content. Thank you, John. Uh, let's go to Albert. Yeah, I think that uh, for me, my biggest theory is that um, we often think about when we think about audience, uh, we think about we think that their time is a limited resource, but we don't think enough about how their brain energy, cognitive energy, mental energy is a limited resource that that we are using as well, right? Their attention. Uh, you know, as we all know, brain is the most expensive organ in our body. Uh, it's a single organ that consumes the most amount of calories in the body, 20%, right? So well, you everyone has their own limited amount of cognitive energy that they can spend each day. But when you are trying to maximize that, right, through like a lot of uh, uh, sensory input, 
whether that is visual or audio. For example, you have a background music, four people, four different people talking at the same time, noise overlaps, and then background noise. Like it's it's just way too much, right? Um, and it's it's abusing the limited amount of resource that that we have. Um, and I know that oftentimes we we in the past we thought best better design is uh, something that is more provocative that is more appealing uh, and that grabs attention but what what we uh, also uh, miss from that is we are actually um consuming the limited amount of scarce uh, energy uh, uh, that uh, mental energy in such a short amount of time which means that it's never a long term sustainable solution so we need to um uh, and oftentimes the the most common reaction that people find in terms of the audio right there's too much uh, audio uh, input at the same time different noises then people leave the space or they don't come back that's the most common uh, reaction that, that that we find so i think that um uh, it's important to kind of guide the audience to the right path uh with with your audio in terms of like oh what to pay attention to rather than oh like just mix everything around and then oh you just you know find out whatever works for them whatever appeal whichever thing works appeals to the to the audience yeah thanks albert let's go to laura Thank you. Um, I did put a link, Chad put a link in the chat to a um, article that Alex Lindsay wrote at the, on, Medi on Medium at the beginning of the pandemic. And it, it's a rebuttal to a, 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 a study done. And it really brings up some very interesting points about good audio, good video, and what really causes Zoom fatigue. Excellent. And uh, Brendan wanted to uh, make another comment. Yeah, I just wanted to briefly put it out there. Uh, so th there's a variety of deaf people. You have hard of hearing and then you have deaf, full on deaf people. And you have some people who have mild hearing loss. Uh, Zoom does affect it worse than it would affect me because they have to work so much harder with captions and hope that captions work. Now, Zoom has automatic captions and they're not always great. So that's one simulation. and hopefully that we can provide something and provide a human captioner like cart services that would provide better captioning instead of shit. Excellent. Uh, Mitch, let's go to the next question. And it's from Jack Rupel in Breckenridge, Colorado. How can the narrow diverse find their superpower? Aaron. So the neurodiverse um, in the past have been known for hearing all the negative sides about their, about their disability or whatever they're facing. But in reality, there's a positive and a negative to everything, really. So when I think about my ADHD, there are many times that I forget things. I am very time blind. I think I can do four things in an hour and really it should take four. But then my superpower also on the other end is that sometimes that time blindness helps me to hyper focus and speed through work that I already was working on. For example, I completed a master's program in eight months online because I found all the classes that I found interesting to be right in that wheelhouse. So I was able to have no teacher direct me and just do that on my own. So because I had the choice and it was something that was in my wheelhouse, in my interest level, I was able to complete all my tasks and graduate with a 4.0. And that was all self-directed. So I think you have to consider both sides of the coin when it comes to neurodiversity that Yes, there are amazing things that people can do, but then there are also things that people struggle with. But if you have a strong support system around you, you can let them know about what you struggle with and maybe they can find ways to help you out so that that can become a superpower as well. 
Thanks, Aaron. Let's go to uh, Brendan. Yes. Well, to find your superpower from, you have to do first is trial and error. Um, so I didn't know that I had ADHD until two years ago. And prior to that, you know, I, I would, it's great to know now because that helps a lot, but prior to that was kind of off. But I'm very good multitasker. You know, I can do different things at different times. I can spread out my attention. But when I come into, at that time, my job was a hardware manager or hardware engineer, for correction. And I was able to do that and other stuff at the same time. And that was a big pro of, uh, you know, being an ADHD. I was able to manage and not, you know, get off track too much. That's a negative time because sometimes you do get off track a little bit. But as long as you know yourself, you'll be great. And also what helps is that the people to tell you when they tell you you're doing a great job, that positive affirmation, that helps and that keeps you on uh, track as well, that support system. Let's go over to uh, John now. So Aaron, it's interesting you talk about being having attention deficit, but being able to uh, complete a master's program in eight months. So you can focus and get attention. Um, for, for me, I was diagnosed in the sixth grade with a learning disability because I was not learning at the same rate as other students in the class. I was put into a slow learning class for seventh grade where I learned to learn slowly. And by eighth grade, I was disruptive. Uh, so dys dyslexia was what they uh, said my issue was, but it was really uh, the ability to see letters in their arrangement. So the, you know, the dyslexic joke, what do you think about at night? Is there a dog? Uh, for me, when you think of a superpower, I think everyone on this panel who spells words the same way every time lacks creativity. Uh, for me, anytime I write a word, it's a good question of how it's going to turn up. When you have what at the time was a learning disability, I had to do accommodations. And we talked, Brendan, you talked about, you know, accommodations. And uh, Albert, you said the same thing. You know, we don't do them. We don't do that. That's other people helping do accommodations. As a professor in the university, having grown up with a learning disability, a lot of what I did with my students when they self-identified, and I think they helped identifying with me because I was very open about my learning disability. I had to be because I'd be writing stuff on the right board and students would have to help me spell it because I could not see it. People say, "If what do you mean you can't spell? As a university senior, I was spelling under the Iowa basic skills at the third grade level. Although for my age and information, that meant I had zero spelling ability. But I did have a super ability. I knew I had to figure out certain words when I was writing papers. I could remember the page number of words that I couldn't spell. And then I very carefully be able to make sure I spell those words right. So I think when you have a, a quote, disability, my dyslexia, you find how to do accommodations. And for me, my essence, my creativity, my who I am was affected by my, quote, learning disability. Doesn't mean that you won't be successful. It doesn't mean that you can't figure out how to work in society. We have Steven Spielberg, famous uh, uh, filmmaker, has dyslexia. Albert Einstein had dyslexia. So I think that the problem is when you're different than everybody else, everyone wants to you know, say, well, just do this. And I know through school when people said, well, if you don't know how to spell the word, look it up in a dictionary. You can't look it up in a dictionary if you don't know what the first letter is. And for, for me, it's helping students identify when they have some sort of disability and not say it's a problem with me, but it's more a problem with the system. Um, I think I'm psychologically damaged from spelling bees in third grade. We're not going to get rid of spelling bees, but I was always the last person picked 
and the first person to go down. So I think your superpower is how you embrace your disability or your uh, neurodiversity and move forward. Thanks, John. Uh, Albert. Yeah, I think uh, this is a great question because um, I do know that a lot of times when we talk about neurodiversity and cognitive learning disabilities, uh, we only think about the struggles and challenges. But I think this also puts a, a different light on, on the disability that we have. And um, I really love this quote from Spider-Man movie uh, where Uncle Ben, uh, before he passed away, he told Peter, um, with great power comes great responsibility. And I love that that quote. Uh, and I personally think that, you know, uh, my disability is actually a great power. And, and, and it comes with a great responsibility uh, that I have to, I had to learn how to, uh, how to handle this, this superpower, right? Um, and, and the journey of learning how to handle never ends, right? Uh, it, oh, I learned it once, I'm done. Oh, I'm good. No, it's not like that. It's constant struggle and repetition, repetition after repetition. So, you know, uh, I go through CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, and then, and then um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm that, good. No, it's not like that. I, I keep learning and uh, going through the journey. To have them go, so, we'll deal with it later. On, another thing is that um, for me, I have OCD and ADHD, and uh, which seemingly uh, seem pretty uh, opposite to each other, right? So they could actually work in the worst possible combination uh, uh, combo uh, sometimes. For example, I get distracted to, to a different task uh, th that is uh, not, prior not my priority, but I get obsessed to complete that task. So it's the worst combination. But sometimes it does work in a, in a good, uh, better combination where um, I, I'm obsessed about this one task and I need to move on to another task, then I, I get distracted uh, through ADHD. And now I uh, ha have a better control of my OCD in a way. But it's 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 a, it's an understatement that I'm able to, uh, I, I, would, I would be arrogant to say that I'm able to handle this, uh, you know, elegantly, right? It's really uncontrollable many times. And it's it's constant struggle. And I do want to mention one more thing that um, my PTSD, for example, also has a, uh, comes with some superpower. For example, uh, because of my uh, PTSD, I, I'm very observant, extremely observant, hypersensitive, right? So when I was in in high school, for example, I was going to this uh, Benfield uh, Marine Research Center uh, with my, with my high school uh, biology class students uh, on a bus. And then I was looking outside the window and I saw old trees at the top of the trees, the uh, trees were tilted in, in one direction. And I was like, oh, like, what is that? That's weird. Old trees at the top, it was tilted in one direction. And then when, when I arrived at the uh, Marine Research Center, the uh, the researcher there uh, who, who was organizing uh, asked everyone, hey, have you guys on your way noticed that all the trees at the top, they are tilted in one direction? And nobody apparently noticed it, but it was actually just me. And um, um, I, I raised my hand. I said, oh, yeah, I did. I did notice. And apparently there was some biological reason for it. Um, so things like this, I'm very uh, observant and, and, and hypersensitive. So I, which means that, it, which can be seen as a creative as well sometimes. Like I'm able to uh, see things that other people don't. And, and I bring uh, unique perspectives. Right. And also um, because of my hypersensitivity, I'm also very empathetic, which actually helps with my job. Right. Uh, in terms of user experience, being able to empathize from uh, a different users uh, uh, experience. Right. It's, it's very easy for me to put myself into other person's shoes and, and think uh, about the challenges that they go through and um, experiences that they go through. So it is there are definitely uh good size of it and there it can be a superpower but um you should never underestimate the responsibility that comes with it 
Thanks, Albert. And I, I want to thank all of you for commenting. You know, that this, uh, all of you are really opening up and, you know, bringing out some kind of vulnerable uh, statements here. And I, you know, I really hope this helps our audience appreciate and understand. Um, this is an important topic. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's tough to open up like this. So I, I really want to thank each of you for, uh, you know, for opening up in the way that you are. So uh, let's go ahead to the next question. From Vic Hernandez in Springfield, Missouri, how do we move neurodiversity discussions from accommodating those with identified and diagnosed issues, obviously important, to how we can optimize neurological function for all? Let's go to Aaron. So a couple of things that came to mind when I saw this question was based on a question from the previous hour in that there are so many accommodations that help neurodiverse people as well as neurotypical people, things like closed captioning that helps anyone that is struggling to understand what is being said on a video or some sort of visual through like TV, movies, things like that. Um, but thinking about helping everyone, I think one of the biggest things we can do is chunking things or breaking down information to make it easier for all to, to access. Because I know when I throw things at my students, like a huge list of things to do, their eyes glaze over and they see maybe the first one. But when we break things down, whether for adults or for children and say, these are the three things that need to be done. We'll take care of the rest later. It makes a lot more sense for students and adults. And just another thing just to keep in mind is that we aren't just our neurodiversities. We are a whole host of different things. We are from being, from how we identify ourselves, whether we identify through our profession or through our neurodiversity or who we're related to, we're not just a disability. There's so much that everybody brings to the table. Excuse me, everyone brings to the table. So in order to accommodate everyone, we should see what they need and what others need, because that can also help others. Thanks, Aaron. That's great. Uh, let's go over to Brendan. Yeah, thank you, Erin. You made so many great points there. So much. If you do too much at once, it can overwhelm anyone. So if you have, keep it as simple as possible and make sure it's understandable at a level that most people can understand. Because some people like to use different language and, you know, and that just takes some people out. I have a PhD, but I try to process and, and to think things differently and, and, try to make sure that I'm, uh, if someone provides something, say in a meeting that you're listening to someone that is talking a whole bunch and they provide this huge long list, I'm out of it. I, I just, I, I watch and then just kind of glaze over as well, but it's just keep things as simple as possible. And that will fit everyone as much as possible. The language choices that you use, the agenda and the time that you make for people, the questions, give people questions ahead of time so they can think before they walk in. And then like, I, ha I I take notes, I have post-its everywhere and I always take notes on the questions. And cause then I know, okay, this is what I wanna say next time. This is what I'd like to do. So, and that's includes like job interviews as well. I'm sure many people have problems during job interviews cause you're on the spot and, and that can that can cause brain issue or that, that stoppage too as well. And uh, when you use like Zoom or other web platforms, for people, people have uh, problems with different buttons and different things. And it's not automatic, but that's one example is Zoom is, has issues with that. People don't know exactly all the buttons and all the technology to use. Next question is from Morgan Price in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. How can we lean into neurodiversity in teamwork and what kinds of structures are more useful and how can you test what is working or not working for your team? Let's go to Aaron. So I work on a team of other third grade teachers as well as teachers in my building. So one of the biggest things to look for are to know your strengths and to know your weaknesses. 
whether you're neurodivergent or neurotypical, we all have strengths and weaknesses. So I believe the best way we can lean into teamwork is to share those strengths and weaknesses with your team and say, hey, I'm not great with X, Y, Z. Is anybody else great with this? And assigning tasks to people whose strengths line up with what is being brought to the table. That, uh, for example, on my team, I'm known as the technology person. So anytime there's anything that needs to be done digitally, I'm there. I've done it in five minutes while others are still turning on their Chromebooks. So I think if you know your strengths, you know your weaknesses and share that, let other people help you and take on the tasks that you find more difficult, I think that's going to help the most for your team. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, let's go to Albert. Yeah, I think uh, something I wanted to share about uh, building an inclusive team for especially neurodivergent uh, 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 teammates is, is that I think um, we need to know, uh, I, I call it an inclusive leadership. And um, what it is, is basically knowing that negative feedback is never a long-term sustainable solution. Um, so uh, especially for neuro neurodivergent individuals, uh, because of the social stigma and um, images and everything, uh, we have enough self-criticism within ourselves, right? So that uh, we don't need any more from outside. <laughs> um, and um, I, I, so knowing that negative feedback is never a long-term sustainable solution, but positive feedback is, right? And another thing is, um, creating a safe environment. And how do we create a safe environment? We, uh, you make sure that feedback is welcomed. When someone is sharing a feedback, or I, I think, you know, when someone is raising hand and they share feedback, you need to welcome that so that you set a culture and tone in the, in the team that, oh, feedback is always welcomed. And don't assume that and generalize that everyone is everyone's experience is going to be the same as what you know, right? Even if the diagnosis is the same, right? Uh, you cannot assume that all the experience of uh, uh, people what uh, neurodivergent uh, teammates go through uh, are are the same, right? So rather than assuming, always ask, right? Always ask, and there's a different way to ask, right? W would you ask, for example, hey, what is the accommodation you need? Versus, hey, you know, we really want to, um, uh, we really, really want this team to be inclusive and welcoming to you. And, and, and we want to set, set you up for success. How can you, uh, uh, you know, remove any barriers? Or how can we make it uh, uh, more comfortable for you so that you can perform uh, at your own uh uh, best uh, rate, right? Things like this, rather than, hey, you know, uh, we provide reasonable accommodation. What is, what, what uh, do you want to disclose? What your disability is, and you know, what do you need? It's a there is a difference between legal compliance versus uh, building an inclusive culture. Legal compliance is only a beginning point. It's right. So I I wanted to mention that. And one more thing. Um, Knowing and trusting what what the uh, neurodivergent team uh, uh, teammate is sharing when they need an accommodation, trusting because they know their best about what they need, and a lot of times, uh, for example, such as panic attack or anxiety attack, are not anticip not ex um, predictable, so it's episodic, uh, and, and when they ask for accommodation, I I have to miss this meeting or something. Uh, and, and you say, oh, no, it's mandatory. You have to do it. Or like you, you try to guilt trip them. Uh, then they are never going to ask for accommodation again, right? It, it's not an inclusive uh, team, team culture. So understanding that uh, some of the episodes will be uh, um, sudden and unpredictable. So you need to be able to uh, uh, ready, be ready to accommodate that. Um, and making multiple ways to access the information that is available for the team, right? Uh, and this is also on WCAG uh, guideline, um, not just one single route. Um, uh, for example, in having captions uh, turned on, 
uh, making all meetings recorded uh, and having the transcript available after the meeting so that neurodivergent teammates know in the back of their mind, their mind that, oh, like if I miss some information right now, I do know in the back of my mind that, oh, you know, there's a second option that I can go through. Maybe I'll I'll find that information that I just missed on in the captions, or uh, I'll find it in the recording later or or transcript. So I don't have to catch every single information right on the spot, or otherwise I'll lose all that information, right? So it's a, it's a very anxiety provoking. So having that second options and uh, multiple ways to access information also uh, uh, helps build a, a inclusive uh, a team. Thanks, Albert. Uh, John. Quickly, Tim, you thanked us for revealing our uh, disabilities or our challenges. And Aaron, you made the point of being public with it. And I think that's what you do with a team. When I was in a team, I would tell them, I can't spell, you're going to see it. If I didn't say that, they would want to know how to deal with that. And so I think to lean in is to let your team know. And it gives permission for your team members also to say, or whatever challenges they may have. Thanks, John. Let's go to the next question. From Aaron Graham in Boston, uh, Massachusetts. What accommodation, either professional or personal, is the most helpful to members of the panel? Uh, Brendan. Yes, <clears throat> Brendan here. I would say, um, the best way for a person to feel most included is having the agenda ahead of time um, prior to the meeting so you can look through it, give any material prior to the meeting. <clears throat> Also making sure that the environment is good, the physical environment for whoever is going to be attending the meeting. So it's less stressful, right? It can be um, a little bit more laid back and, and less stressful. So that's just my two cents, my feedback. Thanks. And uh, Aaron. The most helpful accommodation for me is the speed on audio and, um, and videos, because the moment that my audiobook goes from 2.75 speed to one, I panic because I cannot focus at that speed. So that is my most helpful accommodation. And uh, John? Not all accommodations that people give you are helpful. With my spelling issues, the, the accommodation some of the uh, faculty members gave me as a student was use a spell checker. But when you spell as poorly as I do, you don't know what word that's going to generate. So they, they couldn't figure out why a spell checker wasn't a helpful accommodation. Thanks, John. And uh, Mandy. I use text-to-speech tools or a screen reader to proofread a document after I've already visually proofread it or I didn't use those uh, spell check and grammar tools. And when I do listen <clears throat> to the document, what I'm listening for is just that the order that I put everything makes sense because sometimes that does not come out the way I thought or missing words. So I will often find some mistakes that I didn't catch with those other methods of proofreading when I listen to the document with the speech voice. Thanks, Mandy. And um, let's try to get the one last question in here real quick. So uh, go ahead. Yeah, Doug. Douglas Carmichael, how should neurodiverse people market themselves professionally? Should we focus on one specific professional path or focus on marketing a variety of skills? And uh, Albert. Yeah, um, I actually want to uh, uh, rephrase the question, if I may, rather than how should neurodiverse people market themselves professionally, how do you want to, right? Because uh, I, I say this because actually um, uh, one of the things that I learned in my coping mechanism and is through CBT is that uh, uh, must, so there's a term called masturbation. I, I, I always feel like, what should I do? What, what do I have to do? What, uh, like I must do this, otherwise world is gonna end. But I don't think that one size fits all, and I don't. I, I don't really believe that there's only one chance 
right? There's multiple chances. And so when I want to answer this question, um, how should neurodiverse people, how, how do we want to market uh, themselves for professional? It depends on the profession, for of course, right? Um, but it, it uh, like depends on, uh, and I don't, I, I highly doubt that uh, one person has just one uh, skill to uh, 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 promote, right? Uh, I think we have multiple. I think it it, it comes with self awareness, right? When we uh, try to think about, oh, like what are some of the uh, things that I, I excel at? Uh, what are uh, I think there's uh, multiple things uh, that that we always uh, find. So I think mentioning those and also try to fit into uh, different roles, like depending on what job uh, role it is. Um, uh, try to uh, if you have multiple skills, try to uh, customize into that. Uh, uh, to fit that role specifically. And uh, um, so I think the question is uh, very broad and it's hard to uh, generalize uh, for the all roles. But what I wanted to uh, personally mention is that there's no such thing as one size fits all and there's no such thing as, well, we must do this to, to get a job or to market ourselves. I think there's uh, many different ways. There's not there's not just one correct answer. That's what I'm trying to answer. There's multiple correct answers. So uh, so I think it's important for us to think more uh, broadly and and open ourselves to multiple uh, solutions. Excellent. Thank you, Albert. And and with that, um, you know, stay open, learn, uh, learn from the community, and and ask people what their needs are. Um, as we wrap up today, I just want to thank our panelists. Uh, thank you so much for contributing today. And a special thank you to Albert uh, for joining us and providing your contribution. And uh, thanks to the producers, uh, all the people that asked questions today without you. Um, you know, this this would be a, a different show. It would be uh, our conversation. So thank you for, for contributing. And uh, just for some reference of, of you know, how uh, how much impact we had around the world today, the as the questions were asked, we uh, we traversed uh, 29,969 miles. That's 46,230 kilometers. Um, if you need a different scale, that's 237 million bananas. Uh, so it's about 1.2 times around the earth. So we, uh, we, we traveled a great distance today. So thank you so much. Uh, watch office hours through the week and please join us for Accessibility Saturdays next Saturday. Uh, thank you very much. Good job, Tim, Laura. Excellent. Thanks for joining us, Albert. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Albert. Thank you, Laura and Karen, for interpreting. Karen, I know we're a couple minutes over. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.